welcome to um, to uh, the LSE for this evening's It's a Hybrid event. So there's folks online. Welcome to all of you. Uh, my name is Peter Tribowitz. I'm a professor in the International Relations Department here and the direct in a, director of the uh, Fallon United States Center, which is hosting uh, the event tonight. And we're very uh, pleased to be welcoming Ambassador Maria Masha Jovanovic to LSE. I think as everybody knows in the theater um, tonight, she was a US ambassador to Ukraine from 2016 uh, to 2019, a posting that really capped off a long and distinguished uh, career in the US Foreign Service that included um, earlier postings. Do I need a mic? I think I do, and I can speak. I think I, I, I can hear something echoing when I speak. They, they can keep you on the microphone. They can't hear you at home. Jamila, you got to get <laughs> mic'd up. Just put that in your pocket. Okay. And then just confirm my stuff. I just point to the future. Is that good? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we're good to go. So, as I was saying, you know, a long and distinguished career that included um, postings um, as uh, ambassador to. Um, Kyrgyzstan and Armenia, uh, as well as overseas assignments in Moscow, Mogadishu, and London. Um, longtime student of Russian history, she received her BA from Princeton, her MA from the National War College, additional training at the Pushkin Institute uh, in Moscow. Um, she's known in the US Foreign Service as a diplomat's diplomat. And in 2020, uh, in recognition of her um, distinguished career uh, and service, was awarded the J. Raymond um, Trainer uh, Award for Excellence in the Conduct of um, Diplomacy. She's currently a State Department, um, uh, Senior State Department Fellow uh, at Georgetown at their Institute for the Study of Diplomacy, a Senior Fellow in the Russia and Eurasia Program, uh, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I think many of us got to know um, the ambassador, Masha, uh, from TV um, a few years ago. Um, and I, have a, I actually have a private bet with her um, <laughs> regarding her, what I would describe as a larger than life performance. Um, she says too much has happened since then for people to remember. Well, certainly a lot has happened since then. Um, but um, I think people remember the congressional, her congressional testimony um, at the impeachment hearings of uh, President Donald Trump. It's, I think for many people, very vivid. Um, but I suppose you'll let us know who wins that bet. It's just a gentle person's bet. There's no money on the table. Um, <laughs> But I, I think this is gonna be a very um, wide ranging, what we hope is a, a wide ranging discussion that will um, begin with um, some uh, lessons from her book, Lessons from the uh, Edge, which is a, is a great read if you haven't uh, already read it. Uh, and then uh, we'll turn to, um, to the Ukraine war um, today and, um, and I hope uh, have time to talk about the future of uh, US foreign policy as well. Let me also welcome my uh, co-host uh, tonight, uh, Professor Tamila Lankana, who is from the Department of International Relations as well at LSE. Um, Tamila is a leading expert um, on uh, Russia. She's published widely on topics ranging from authoritarianism uh, and democracy to the role of propaganda and um, disinformation in world politics. Uh, she also helps coordinate the LSE task force um, to support students and scholars um, displaced and at risk um, uh, due to the war in Ukraine here at, at the LSE. Um, so here's the game plan and then we'll get started. Um, so Tamila and I are gonna put a few questions to the ambassador for maybe like the first 20, 25 minutes, I, I would say. And, um, and then we'll open it up to all of you and those of you online. 
Um, if, for those of you online, just submit your questions via the Q&A function. And um, uh, Chris Gilson from the US Center is here and we'll keep track of them. And we'll feather those questions in as well as we move along. Um, and for you, uh, those of you in the theater, um, I'll let you know when we're op when we open for questions and you just raise your hand and the ushers will, uh, after I call on you, the ushers will come and give you the mic. Um, and I think for everybody, whether if you're online, please provide your name um, and your affiliation. If there's a connection to LSE, please let us know that as well. And same uh, in, in the audience. Um, I think um, that's pretty much it for all the logistics. So please join Tamila and I and put your hands together and give the ambassador a warm LSE welcome. So Tamila and I flipped a coin. She gets the first couple questions. <laughs> Tamila. Thank you. Ambassador Jovanovic, um, in your memoirs, you provide a fascinating and in some ways tragic account of your family's origins in the Russian Empire and their destinies as emigres in Europe, Canada, and America after the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. For those in the audience who haven't had a chance yet to read your riveting memoir, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the ways your family's values have shaped your worldview and professional ethics as a diplomat. Does having a family background in the region help one better understand it? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, okay, great. So I'm gonna turn my chair a little bit so I'm actually you know, facing the Not audience. I don't need to turn my back to, to you all. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I wrote the book for many different reasons, but in part to honor honor my parents uh, who um, separately made their way to Canada and then to, um, together to the United States. Um, and their, uh, their journey through wartime Europe uh, was I think uh, a very common one for people who ended up settling in Canada and, and the United States after the war. Um, and I would say that certainly there was tragedy along the way and really hard times, no question about it. Um, but in the end, um, it was actually a really hopeful and optimistic story because um, they were able to settle in, you know, this bucolic town called Kent in the state of Connecticut, and they were able to raise um, me and my brother in, um, you know, in, in the freedom that democracy provides. Uh, and I think that was really, really important to both of my parents because they had lived and grown up in regimes that were totalitarian. So they knew what it was not to live in freedom. They knew what it was um, to be worried uh, about the knock on the door. Uh, they knew what it was not to be able to worship in the way that you pleased. And um, so they um, brought both of us up, um, both my brother and I, who's actually here today, <laughs> um, to, um, to value um, democracy, to value what that means, um, and to value the freedom that, that we lived in, and, um, and to give back. Both of my, teacher, uh, both of my parents were teachers, um, they believe that, um, you know, we were fortunate to be in the United States uh, and that um, even though we didn't have a whole lot materially, we had a lot in other ways that counted and that we were fortunate. And so we needed to give back in some way, um, whatever way we, we chose to do, whether it was, you know, running a Boy Scout troop, uh, whether it was teaching like they did, whether it was something else. So, you know, as I was growing up, I mean, that was, you know, part, um, part of what, um, hope of what we were getting every day. And then um, when I went to university, I went to Princeton University and the motto was Princeton in the nation's service. And from the very, very first lecture we got as freshmen to the very, very end four years later, that's what we heard that, you know, we were lucky, uh, we were getting this great education and we needed to give back to the country. And so, you know, as often happens, I took a lot of detours in my 20s. Um, but in the end, I came back to my first love, which is foreign policy history. And I thought, uh, again, about uh, the Foreign Service, a uh, career in diplomacy. 
um, you know, which is, you know, I, I'd like to recommend it to all the students because this, if you like history, if you like politics, if you like policy, if you want your um, job to really make a difference in people's lives, I mean, diplomacy offers all of that. And plus you get to travel around the world, meet people, um, eat different kinds of foods, and it's, you get paid to do it. <laughs> you, get, you get paid to do all of that. And so I just, um, I decided this was a career for me and that's how I ended up in, in the foreign service. But I would say uh, that my parents uh, were probably the strongest influence in terms of why I decided on a career of service, in this case, the foreign service. Thank you. As a young diplomat posted to the Soviet Union and then countries of Eurasia, yeah. you must have experienced challenges that even seasoned diplomats would find daunting, let alone diplomats who are just beginning their careers like you were uh, when you first started in your uh, 20s. Looking back, I wonder if you might share with us a few of the lessons from those early formative years. Uh, of the in the foreign service that help you cope with the challenges you confronted later in your career and especially the appalling way that the Trump administration has sought to undermine your credibility as America's ambassador to Ukraine. That is a long, long question. <laughs> and, <a difficult one. laughs> and there's a lot to unpack here, so I'm not sure I'm going to get to all of it. Um, but first, I, I think we need to, um, to let the audience know how you and I actually know each other. So um, back, um, back in the day, uh, when I was a young diplomat, uh, the Soviet Union uh, had, um, had fallen apart um, back in 1991, and the US and the UK uh, we're setting up embassies in the region. The U.S. Um, set up uh, embassies in each one of the, the new countries. And so um, they were sending out teams to sort of temporarily staff these new embassies as we were finding a building, as we were doing all the things you knew, need to do to set up a new enterprise. And so I was assigned to go out to Tashkent as, um, as one of the um, uh, temporary people that would you know, sort of help set things up in the very beginning. And Tamila was working at the embassy. Um, I think the embassy when I got there was about six weeks old. Yes, and it was a very makeshift operation. It was a makeshift operation. <laughs> that was my you. first ever job. <laughs> yeah, and it was almost my first ever job in diplomacy. <laughs> so, um, you know, there we were, um, all of us, you know, kind of the blind leading the blind. But it was an incredibly exciting time because here is this new country, um, Uzbekistan. Uh, that was, um, you know, just starting on its way. I mean, a very ancient civilization um, and absolutely fascinating. And I would encourage you all to, to go because it's, it's, it's just, you know, Samarkand, Tashkent, Bukhara, um, you know, the places are just evocative of, of history and culture. Um, but, you know, there we were um, trying to establish relations with the Uzbeks. Um, we already had a building, which was, I think, the old Komsomol building. It was, yes. yeah. So that very was very lax security as well. Very lax security. In fact, there was a gunman who shot his way into our our little makeshift embassy, and we were all held hostage for several hours um, until um, un until the um, I think it was the KGB basically um, that uh, talked him down, and he was never seen again. Um, but it was, you know, I mean, you know, tragically for, for, for this individual who obviously um, had some, some, some mental issues. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a whole new world and we were um, setting off and, um, and creating that world with, um, you know, in, in, in Tashkent and working with the Uzbeks to establish relations. It was very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Peter, hmm. over to you. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm kind of tempted to pursue that, but I feel like I should probably. Yeah, I have a feeling I didn't even answer the question. What's that? I have a feeling I didn't even answer the question. Well, kind of her, was, what are the takeaways? How, how did you, Some of the yeah, takeaways. what did I learn there? So um, I think one of the things I learned in Tashkent and in my other um, postings in, uh, you know, in my early career was um, the important, you know, so like everybody assumes that you're going to be smart, right? And that you can think strategically, but you also have attention to detail, that you're a good communicator, that you write well, um, and you know you can communicate orally as well. So these are all the givens. But the other things that um, I learned in a situation like Tashkent, where we were basically creating everything fresh um, and not getting a whole lot of guidance from Washington, 
is you need to be creative, you need to be innovative, you need to figure out how to get things done, and you need to be persistent. Um, and that persistence is, um, you know, sometimes it's, you know, going back to the ministry, you know, day after day to get to, day, to get the right answer. Sometimes it's year after year after year. Um, that's um, that you can't give up just because somebody tells you no. You need to figure out a different way to ask the question. You need to figure out a um, different way to formulate the problem. You need to listen really hard to see where, uh, where the areas of confluence might be, where you can get a possible agreement you know, for part of the problem that you can build on later for something else. Um, and it's just really important. The other thing that um, I think I, I learned in Tashkent and also in other places um, that I served in the early days was um, the importance of relationships. I mean, diplomacy is no different than any other business, whether you're in sales, whether you're um, you know, a teacher with a student, uh, whatever kind of work you do, it's about human relationships. I mean, even now in our age of um, you know, Zoom and you know, the, the uh, virtual audience and everything else, human relationships are really um, you know, the essence of what we, do, we, we, we create in diplomacy. And it's really important to tend to those relationships to, um, you know, again, listen really hard to what people are trying to tell you. And sometimes they're telling you things in a way that um, we, you know, me as an American, you all as, um, as um, English or British um, people, we may not understand it uh, right away or intuitively because it's, it's, it's coming from a different culture. And so people are telling you things in a different way or they're telling you things that you have, you know, nothing in your experience can really um, prepare you for what they are telling you. And so um, I think listening hard is a, a really important trait. And I think back to um, Secretary Schultz, who was Ronald Reagan's um, um, uh, secretary. Uh, uh, and um, he, um, he had this metaphor, which he called tending the garden. And so the garden being our world, and he said, you know, what diplomats do is not very exciting, you know, but day in, day out, they're tending the garden, they are fertilizing the beautiful roses, they are pulling out the weeds, they are doing all the things that is necessary to maintain a garden and keep it beautiful and keep it strong. Um, I mean, you all are here in the UK, so you know what happens if you don't tend your garden. I mean, it becomes a mess pretty quickly. And so you need to do this day in, day out. Um, and it's often not very exciting. Uh, it's often just, uh, you know, the dailiness of the chores. Um, and, you know, the, the prayer actually for diplomats is that um, your country, you know, where, wherever you are posted, um, that you are minding the store so well that if, um, you know, all of a sudden Washington calls and says, you know, we need country X to do whatever the request is, that the foreign minister, the president, the prime minister of that country will say, yes, we're all in. Um, the other thing that you pray for is that um, you have been tending the garden so well um, that um, there isn't a, a dispute with your country that hits the news. I mean, the best thing in diplomacy is if there is no news, um, that it's all just humming along. You know, we, we may not see eye to eye on everything, um, but things are humming along and, um, you know, under the surface, there may be tensions, but we're managing it. That is, um, you know, that is what tending the garden is all about. And I saw that firsthand early in my career, and I continued to see it, you know, until the very end. And, and now, you know, as I watch the news. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I just follow up yeah. and say that I like the metaphor of the tending of the garden. And, um, but in your book, you describe the day to day of diplomacy, the actual practice of it, which is incredibly challenging and demands really a lot of kind of selflessness even and dedication. I think this book is really amazing in that sense for anybody who is, you know, considering going into the foreign service. I think this is a must read because it really brilliantly captures. It, it, for me, it was really revealing because obviously I worked as a local staff in the embassy and just um, learning about how the diplomats experience the day to day and all the challenges um, is just really incredible. I think it's, it's fantastic. It really goes through that in great detail and in a very captivating way. Thank you. Yeah. So I, I want to switch gears a little bit. I, 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 I actually want to get to Ukraine, but just on the way, I want to ask you a little bit about 
the impeachment hearings. Um, so um, I, it's, we were talking about it before upstairs in the green room before coming here. It's a riveting account um, and, um, and probably a difficult account to, um, to write. When I, I was reading it, um, I mean, I, I watched it, so it, but it does kind of come flooding back. And there's, you know, there's these remarkable moments like Trump tweeting in the middle of your testimony, you responding in a deadpan, I would say pretty devastating way in real, I mean, very kind of even keeled. And, and then like by the time you get to the weekend, it's on Saturday Night Live, the whole thing, you know? And I actually, I, I, was, I was wondering whether I had you know, made that up and I actually Googled it and you can, you find it there. And I'm just wondering, like, <clears throat> for you, when you look back on, I mean, it, it's in the account, but maybe to just share it. I mean, is it the, was it just the surrealness of it? I mean, what's the, like, kind of takeaway from that moment for you? Was it, it was surreal. The stakes were incredibly high, it seems to me, for you personally, but I think for the, for the country, you know? Um, so it's been a few years. I'm just kind of curious. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, and looking back, I mean, it's still surreal to me. I mean, I was a diplomat, you know, somebody who I just told you, I mean, we work behind the scenes, ideally. We're not out front and we're not public people. Uh, we're working quietly with other governments to get stuff done. And so to be caught, and, and the other thing I would say is that um, as a career diplomat, I'm not a political person. I have, you know, career diplomats, you know, we have our thoughts and our views and we vote a certain way, um, but we keep that to ourselves. That's not part of our job um, over, um, you know, whether it's a democratic or a Republican government, uh, we work for that government and for that president and pursue that foreign policy that, um, that you know, is the president's foreign policy. And so um, to all of a sudden become caught up in our domestic politics in the United States was very unexpected and quite frankly, very painful because I, um, you know, I was caught between uh, the executive branch where I worked and um, our congressional branch, uh, the legislature, uh, caught between Republicans and Democrats in advance of US presidential elections. That is not a good place for a career person to be, believe me, not a good place at all. And so, um, and it was frightening. Uh, it was frightening when, um, you know, just to remind you, in the summer of 2019, former President Trump had a phone call with um, President Zelensky of Ukraine. And um, President Trump called that phone call the perfect phone call. Um, it was far from perfect. And what, you know, most people focused on, and, and I did too, but mo what most people focused on was um, President Trump basically, um, uh, you know, bullying um, President Zelensky to start a prosecution against the, um, the Biden family um, in exchange for um, the Javelin missiles that now everybody knows what they are. And, um, but there was something else in that phone conversation. And, and that's what was the proximate cause for the investigations in Congress that then led to the first impeachment of, of Donald Trump. Um, but there was something else in that phone conversation. And that's what I was focused on because um, the two presidents talked about me. That is very unusual. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, to talk about uh, an ambassador, a sitting ambassador would be unusual. To talk about an ambassador who has left post several months prior is really weird. Um, but nevertheless, um, um, President Trump did raise me and he told Zelensky, um, she's gonna go through some things. And I didn't know that in July when the conversation occurred, but when, mm -hmm. um, former President Trump released a transcript of that call in September. That's what I was focused on um, because um, the um, Congress was already calling me, asking questions, wanting me to appear, et cetera, et cetera. It was not yet an, an impeachment. And I thought, what does the most powerful person in the world mean by that sentence that she's gonna go through some things? And I didn't know, because he had already basically fired me. 
his um, you know, group around him led by Giuliani had already um, basically you know, ruined my reputation. But what more can they do? What, what else is out there for me? And I didn't know. And at the same time, I was being, um, you know, you know, every day there were new developments. And uh, then I was asked to um, testify before, um, before um, uh, the impeachment inquiry. And first there was a, a, a closed um, testimony, mm -hmm. which was in October. And then there was the public testimony that, that, that you were talking about. And the whole thing really was surreal. And, you know, I, um, I, I didn't really know what to do. <laughs> because on the one hand, you know, I'd love to tell you that I was like, you know, I'm going to tell truth to power. I'm all about this. <laughs> but I'll be honest, I was afraid. Um, I didn't know what was going to come next. Um, I was very fortunate um, that um, somebody put me in touch with this great legal team. I had three amazing lawyers who, um, you know, really walked me through uh, a number of issues. And, um, you know, by the, by the time, um, uh, you know, we kind of went through everything. I mean, I knew that I had to testify because it was the right thing to do. Because Congress is a co-equal branch of government with uh, the executive branch. And written in the Constitution is, you know, are the roles of the two different branches. And one of the roles of Congress is oversight of the executive branch. I mean, this is completely constitutional, constitutional, as is the impeachment process itself. It's written into the Constitution. And Republicans themselves um, had used the, this mechanism. Uh, of oversight and congressional in inquiries, you know, repeatedly over the years, most famously, most recently prior to 2019 um, with the Benghazi inquiry where Secretary of State um, Clinton, I think, I mean, she appeared for at least two days in testimony, yeah. I mean, hours and hours of testimony. Um, so it's not like Republicans were unfamiliar with this concept. Um, they had used it themselves. So uh, in the end, I decided it was the, it was the right thing to do that I had to you know, live with myself. Um, and whatever happened, um, I, had to, um, I had to testify. So, so in the end, that's, that's, that's what I did. And I ended up being the first person to testify. Yeah, well, if you were afraid, it sure didn't show. So- um, <laughs> Yeah, that uh, poker face. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, that's a very interesting kind of- But you know, here, if, if, sorry Go to ahead. interrupt, but you know, here's the other thing that I would say is that um, the State Department itself was under a lot of attack at that time by the yeah. Trump administration, um, starting with the president, including the Secretary of State. And actually, I just read a review of a book that um, Secretary Pompeo just put out where he continues his attacks on, on, on the State Department and the people who worked for him. And so um, I really felt that, you know, it wasn't just me up there. It was, you know, the State Department, um, all of the um, officials who, who made up the State Department. And that I had, you know, you said, you know, that I was sort of deadpan and impassive and so forth. I mean, that wasn't what was going on inside. <laughs> uh, but I felt um, I, I, I had to be um, serious. I had to maintain my composure, although sometimes it was very difficult. Um, I had to do that for the Foreign Service, but I also had to do it for women um, because um, women are judged differently from men. And that if I had become, uh, too emotional, um, either yelling or crying, you know, <laughs> the whole gamut, um, that I would have undermined my testimony and I couldn't let that happen. Right. And so, you know, you really have to get a grip on yourself. Yeah, I mean, Trump was either trying to change the conversation in real time or debate you, it seems, you know. So. Yeah, well, that tweet, um, yeah. you know, in the public testimony, I mean, that was truly surreal. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I thought that, uh, the lawyers had sort of gamed out every possibility with me. You know, this could happen, and this could happen, and are you ready for this question? You know, all of that. Um, but we hadn't anticipated <laughs> that the president of the United States would tweet in real time. Um, and, and of course, what he tweeted was ridiculous. Yes. Um, and um, so I somehow tried to, <laughs> tried to formulate an answer. Um, but here's the thing, um, it actually worked in my opinion, to my advantage, yeah. because um, you know, after that, it was really hard uh, for Republicans to take me on. Um, you know, they asked me many, many questions. Um, uh, you know, over over the course of the day, um, but they couldn't really attack me because it hadn't worked well when the president did. All right. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, just switching gears yet again. Um, 
So I want to ask you, um, before we open things up, to ask you about the, you need water? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Ukraine war. Yeah. Um, so you have tremendous experience in the region. Um, thanks, Tamila. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess the, the question is this, you know, like reflecting back on it. Yeah. What surprised you, what surprises you the most about it? Is it um, like Putin's recklessness? Is it uh, the fortitude of Ukrainians? Um, something else? I mean, maybe that probably that doesn't surprise you, but, but the, the recklessness maybe, I don't know. What is it? Is there, is there something? Um. Well, I don't think that Putin um, believes that he was reckless. Right. I mean, I think he has his worldview, and I think he is a rational actor within his own space. You know, looking at it from the outside, it's reckless. It's not completely rational. But I think, you know, I, I assume that given the information he had, um, uh, given uh, the yes men around him, that right. this was a rational act. Um, but I, I, I guess what surprises me that uh, a country like Russia a leader like Putin would have been so ill-informed and made such grievous mis miscalculations. And, and there are three, at least three major ones. Um, the first is that, you know, Ukraine is not a country. It's not a distinct people. They don't have a culture. They don't have a civilization. They don't have a language. And they are going to welcome uh, the Russian army as liberators. And, um, you know, first of all, anybody who knows anything about Ukraine knows that that is not true. Um, and secondly, um, in 2014, when Russia first invaded Ukraine, um, that's when you could really see the country coming together in a way that had kind of eluded it, um, mm -hmm. you know, since um, before. Um, but Russia's first attacks really brought the Ukrainians together. And, and you could see it in big ways, um, but you could also see it in small ways, um, like people, you know, the beautiful Ukrainian embroidered shirts. They're called Vishivankas. Um, and previously, nobody wore them in Ukraine because that's something, you know, from the village that your grandmother made you wear on holidays and you didn't <laughs> want to wear that stuff. Um, but all of a sudden, everybody was wearing Vishivanki, Vishivankas and um, they were where you know, there was something called uh, Vishivanka Friday, where everybody, including at the U.S. Embassy, wore Vishivankas. It was a way to show national pride. Another thing that, you know, hit me, uh, well, it was um, actually a very emotional moment for me. Um, the 4th of July um, is, you know, obviously, I, I guess I don't need to remind the British, but <laughs> sorry, I guess I'm not such a good diplomat after all. <laughs> You're going to take away that award. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, so you guys know what it is. Enough said about that. So we give a big party and we invite all of our British friends to it. We really do. And, um, and, and um, you know, this is true in every country in the world. And it's our biggest, um, biggest event. And of course, uh, mostly in Ukraine, it was Ukrainians who were present. And um, uh, the way it uh, worked in, in, in Ukraine is there, there, there was a balcony at the residence and you know, I would sort of give the 4th of July address and um, both national anthems are sung. When I was there in the uh, early aughts as the number two at the embassy, you know, all the Americans would sing the national anthem, we would put our hand, our, our, our hand on our heart and you know, it was, it was great. And then there would be the Ukrainian national anthem and you know, nothing, you know, it, it, nobody knew the words, they didn't sing along, you know, nothing. When I went back in 2016, um, you know, we sang our national anthem, we did our patriotic bit and the Ukrainians were all singing and they all put their hands on their hearts. And it was even now, you know, it's just so emotional for me just to see that because this was a country, this was a country full of pride. This was a country that was fighting back against the Russians. I mean, it didn't make that many headlines in the US and probably not in the UK by, the, by 2016, the war was already two years old, but every week, two or three, three Ukrainians would die. Civilians um, near the front line, soldiers um, on the front line. Um, this was a world war in the heart of Europe and it kept on going and um, the Ukrainians were still resisting. Um, and then, um, then of course, uh, 
um, it was a low level war. And I, at least when I was ambassador, I thought, well, the Russians don't really want to own Ukraine. You know, they can destabilize Ukraine, um, thwart Ukraine's European ambitions to join the EU, join NATO um, with this low level intensity war, with um, cyber attacks, with assassinations, et cetera, et cetera. They don't need to own Ukraine because why would you want to you know, govern another country, why would you want to pay for it as well? And I was wrong. Um, Russia was using that time to um, basically get ready to uh, regroup, uh, re-equip, train the troops and everything else. And so the first miscalculation that Putin made was uh, not understanding that Ukraine was a country and that the Ukrainians are a people who, mm. who have great national pride um, and are gonna fight back. The second, um, the second mistake he made was um, in overestimating his military, which, by the way, I think almost all of us uh, overestimated right. the Russian military. Um, but what we saw was a military that lacked good leadership, um, that um, you know it, its equipment was terrible. They didn't have any tactics. I mean, everybody can remember the 40 mile long convoy to Kiev. Um, and you know, Russia, uh, Ukrainian irregulars and 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 um, and military, um, basically just taking out you know all the vehicles one by one. Um, it was remarkable. Um, we could go a lot more into the military side, but that was the second big miscalculation. The third miscalculation, I think, was that Putin looked around uh, the world, and particularly Europe and the United States. And I think he thought um, Joe Biden doesn't have what it takes to be, you know, the great leader. This was, um, or the leader of a coalition to support Ukraine. Uh, this was shortly, um, just to remind, this was shortly after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which obviously um, was not um, a bright and shining moment for the United States or for Afghanistan. Um, I think he looked at Europe. Uh, he looked at the French who were about to go into presidential elections and it was not clear what was gonna happen. Angela Merkel, the most powerful uh, politician in Europe, had left the scene. And Britain obviously ha was having its own challenges. And um, I think he thought, you know, I can do this now. There's not going to be an international coalition that is going to come together and be united and be effective. And he was dead wrong. Right. And so those, I think, are the three biggest miscalculations he made. Um, and it surprises me that... Uh, you know, obviously he is so isolated. I think Russian intelligence obviously is not very good um, and Russian analysis, not very good. Yeah. And hoping that all of that is continuing. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Can I just yeah, follow, well, you up go ahead and follow up and then we'll open really it Really interesting insights. So how, why is it or how is it that we failed to anticipate the hollowness of Russia's claims about its hard and soft power globally? Um, the some the hollowness of Russia's soft and hard power globally. In other words, so we took a lot of Putin's bluff about uh, Russia's hard power and soft power, sort of in some ways at, at face value, or some some pundits certainly uh, did, and others didn't anticipate the ability of Ukraine to resist Russia's attempts to dominate it. So the question is why did we, and I, I, I use we very loosely, obviously that includes you know, a lot of academics, kind of pundits, um, policy analysts, uh, why did we get Putin wrong and what prevented us from seeing things as they really are in Russia? Perhaps as a kind of, as somebody who works in diplomacy and foreign service, you, you, you could share. Yeah, that. I mean, when, when I was still in uh, the US government, we used to remind ourselves as we talked about the Russian threat out there and so forth, the Russians aren't 10 feet tall. <laughs> you know, I mean, don't overestimate them. Um, but I also think it's important even today not to underestimate them, you know, because um, here in Europe um, and in the United States, I think um, we've gotten Putin's number. But, you know, when I look further afield mm. in what we now loosely call the global south, um, I mean, Russian diplomacy is quite effective. Russian mm. disinformation is quite effective. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they spend the time tending the garden. Mm. You know, Lavrov, uh, the foreign minister, he spends a lot of time out there, you know, days on the road, um, pushing um, the Russian messages. Uh, and, you know, just one uh, is that, um, I mean, you all know about the blockade of grain that was causing countries, you know, great dislocations when it came to food supplies. Um, we were worried about famines in certain countries, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Russia's story is that that is because of 
um, uh, because of sanctions against Russia. It has nothing to do with sanctions on Russia. But Russia is filling up that space in countries where I have to say we need to do a better job of tending the garden. Uh, and so um, on the one hand, um, you know, obviously I, I, I was the one who started by saying, you know, the Russians aren't 10 feet tall, um, but they're also not three feet tall. <laughs> you know? right. They are, um, they are uh, uh, still a force to be reckoned with, first and foremost in Ukraine, but around the world as well, and different, in different ways, because they know, know how to use, um, you know, the various um, instruments, whether it's economic, whether it's informational, um, as well as, of course, um, the, the military tool, uh, and they're not shy about using it. And they don't have to, um, you know, every country makes mistakes and the U.S. is, you know, probably first and foremost. Um, but we have to respond to our first, our domestic audience, as well as um, audiences around the world. Russia doesn't care. And, you know, it's, if, if there's a, if a mistake is made, if atro an atrocity is committed, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, and so Russia has a very free hand mm -hmm. when it takes actions um, around uh, around the world, unless the global community stops it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I I think I got a little off track. What what was the actual question? <laughs> no, no, you you actually answered it, it really well. But why why what did we get right or wrong? And, and I think I like the metaphor of ten feet versus three feet. You know, we <laughs> certainly have to find some middle ground in terms of over <laughs> or. or not over and not underestimating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's a very good uh, kind of yeah. way of. I, I would also just add one other thing about uh, about um, you know getting Putin wrong. So uh, in um, you know when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, uh, the Russians Yeltsin and his team asked us for a lot of help. They asked the UK for help, the EU, other countries, and we tried to help them uh, and. Um, you know, did that, um, you know, more or less effectively through the 90s, uh, through the 90s. And, you know, we can talk about that if anybody is interested, because um, there's, uh, there obviously is a lot of backlash in Russia as a result of some of the programs that took place, because uh, that was a terribly difficult time for many, many Russians who were thrust into poverty when, um, when uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the 90s, Yeltsin, who was very ill and a drunk and who uh, was worried that whoever came next um, might put him in jail for corruption issues. Um, he went through a series of prime ministers, you know, sort of auditioning them as possible presidential candidates. And he settled on Putin, uh, you know, who was a relative unknown, very young. And um, Putin, um, you know, after a couple months as um, prime minister um, at the New Year's, the traditional New Year's Eve um, address of the Russian president, Yeltsin, Yeltsin announced a surprise resignation. Um, Putin became the acting president uh, in 2000. And, you know, a couple, a couple months later, there were elections. And, and, you know, I put it in air quotes, but actually, it was, it was a good election. I mean, he, he won um, freely and fairly. Um, and he won on the backs of the Chechen people because he started a war in Chechnya that was brutal and vicious. And he killed thousands and thousands of people, not just Chechens, many thousands of Russians, many of them pensioners. And um, he um, got away with it. Uh, you know, the international community uh, didn't have much to say about that. Um, and then in the early 2000s, um, Putin was very focused on consolidating his power. Uh, he went after the oligarchs, um, you know, most famously Hodorkovsky, um, when he, uh, and the Yukis uh, empire, uh, he went after the press, he went after opposition members, he went after civil society, any activist, anybody who, you know, might sort of raise a voice. And he kept on going back and going back. And, uh, you know, I think 22 was the, the, the low point where there basically is no more free press, there is no opposition, mm -hmm. there is no civil mm -hmm. society. Um, it is, um, you know, back to the USSR. And so he was consolidating his power in those years, but he was also making statements like um, you will remember that he said that um, the greatest tragedy of the last century was the um, dissolution of the Soviet Union. Um, he talked about, uh, you know, he went to um, uh, the Munich Security Conference, I think it was in 2007, and um, said, uh, you know, criticized the US very severely um, and, um, you know, really threw down a gauntlet um, to NATO uh, about what was gonna come next. And the very next year, he uh, invaded Georgia, took two hunks of Georgia, 
And um, the international community did criticize, but we didn't do anything else. There were no sanctions, there was nothing. So he got away with it again. And then, you know, fast forward to 2014, and uh, he invades Ukraine and grabs Crimea. Uh, and, uh, you know, we were surprised and appalled, and uh, it took us a while to regroup and um, sort of figure out what to do. We were talking about sanctions, and there were sanctions packages out there, but, you know, there was a lot of hemming and hawing. And then an airliner went down that killed almost 300 Dutch citizens. And that's when sanctions were implemented. It wasn't because of Ukrainian deaths. Mm -hmm. I mean, just to call a spade a spade. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and so that was in the, um, so the war started in uh, February, March, 2014. That was in July of 2014. And, um, and we continued to levy sanctions against Russia. We kicked them out of the G8 um, where they didn't belong anyway. Um, and, uh, but it, you know, Russia could absorb all of that, it turns out. And, you know, Putin was still coming to international meetings, people still met with him, um, the economy was able to manage um, the sanctions and everything else. And I think Putin thought it was going to be more of the same in 2022. Um, but it turns out that that was actually not, not, not the case. Right. Um, but I, I think that, um, you know, we were surprised in 2014, we were surprised again in 2022 by the um, expansiveness of the ambition and, um, you know, really the brutality of the Russian attack and the heinousness of some of the things they do. For some reason, it's not, it, it's not the killing of people, it's not the torturing of people. What I find most disturbing about Russia's many crimes in Ukraine is the kidnapping of children, at least 15,000, um, um, you know, by, by some counts today, who are being sent to Russia Russian families are, um, are adopting them. Um, those children are, are gonna forget the Ukrainian language. They're not gonna know that they were Ukrainian. They're not gonna know that there are people, but their families in Ukraine love them and are missing them and want them back. I mean, this is, this is a crime against humanity. And um, I think that, uh, you know, these are some of the things that really um, have surprised me and have surprised all of us. And I think that, you know, in the, in the years since Putin took power, there was some magical thinking in the West going on um, because we wanted to believe that Russia was going to be a constructive power in the world, that Russia was gonna be part of the solution, not just part of the problem, that we had created all sorts of um, mechanisms for Russia to participate, inviting them into the G8 when they were not the eighth largest economy in the world, um, setting up a, a NATO Russia um, organization so that there were um, there was a mechanism uh, whereby um, uh, Russia could talk to us, um, the West, about security issues, and on and on and on. I mean, we really tried with Russia, and we wanted that investment to to pay off. And um, unfortunately, that's not what Putin wanted. Um, he was looking in a different direction. Um, he was looking back to empire and to uh, authoritarianism and to power. Well, there's a lot to pursue there. Uh, do you need something? Me? Sorry about that. About that. <laughs> so, but I want to open it up to the audience. So, um, if you've got a question, um, go ahead and raise your your hand, and um, I'm just ask you again, just briefly introduce yourself and. Let's keep the question short. We'll start right here. Maria. Woman, no. Wait for the microphone, excuse me. Thank you. Uh, my name is Maria Zolkina. I'm a DINAM Research Fellow at International Relations Department. I'm Ukrainian, I'm Ukrainian expert. And first of all, thank you for describing this, let's say, human face of what the war crimes are. Yeah. Um, and some greetings from my native hometown to you, which is Stanitsa Luhanska, which was a front line, the only one ser serving checkpoint between temporarily occupied and Ukraine controlled part of, um, uh, of Luhansk region. So we hope we will be able to go there again because this is occupied now. 
Uh, I have two questions which are actually perfectly fitting your, um, your last um, ideas. So first of all, when do you think was that moment or when was that period in US, let's say, foreign policy decision making or agenda setting when Russia really stopped being pers um, considered as a partner in the region, I mean, in Eastern Europe? And Ukraine actually became the main priority when it comes to the region, because Ukraine really felt that Russia is treated as a global power, as the main power in the region, and Ukraine is interesting for US, but it is something secondary. So when did it really change? Uh, and the second question uh, is, um, how do you think why in 2014, when it was already like an, an event like in a row with occupation of Crimea and Donbas. What prevented Obama administration from supporting Ukraine much harder at that time? And what actually changed that in 2022? Was it just the scope of atrocities, the number of atrocities, the scope of invasion, or there, there is something behind that logic? I'm more interested in actually how things were per perceived uh, almost nine years ago and uh, after large-scale invasion oh, last okay. year. Okay, I'm going to ask you to hold your thought there. You know, okay. There's a lot there, so maybe just jot down. <laughs> yeah. We'll take a question over in the side there. <clears throat> uh, so, a very good evening. Um, so my name is Adam DePico. I'm a Master of Public Administration student with Columbia, New York, and here at LSE. And my question, I'm sure, is one that you've been asked many times, which is looking at sort of a resolution for the conflict in Ukraine. and I think as I'm sure we're all aware, there's been many discussions of diplomacy being obviously the, the key to finding a solution, but obviously trying to find an avenue for Putin not to lose face in this whole situation. Obviously there should be no, um, there should be no situation where Putin doesn't get away with the atrocities he's committed, but do you have any sort of ideas of how a resolution could be obtained with Putin obviously still having some sort of play in an international um, sort of environment? Thank you, Masha. Hold it for there, too. We're going to take a question online. Chris, go ahead. <clears throat> Just to say we have over 150 people on the online platform, and they're in China, the UK, the US, Italy, Taiwan, Poland, and Ukraine. So one question comes from online from Gabrielle von Bruck. Do you think that President George Bush's support for NATO's aspiration in 2009 to extend towards Russia's borders was reckless and one of the causes of the current war? So there's a lot there, and I'm going to ask you to be like brief too, so we can get because I no because I can see there's a lot of hands. So we're okay. to get in people. Well, I think you already know I don't do brief. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, so um, in terms of 2014 versus 2022, um, I think uh, you know you will probably disagree with it. I certainly disagree with it, but I think the Obama administration, I think President Obama personally felt that. Um, he did not want to provide um, weapons, um, specifically the javelin, uh, to Ukraine um, because Russia could perceive this as provocative. Now, uh, I think many people in his administration, uh, and I was not, you know, on this account at that time, um, but many people in the administration felt, you know, actually it's kind of Russia that is the provocateur here because they're invading a sovereign country. Um, but I think President Obama felt strongly uh, that we wanted to support Ukraine, um, but we didn't want to do anything that would um, provoke Russia to um, enlarge the war. You know, so fast forward to 2021, uh, when uh, the Biden administration, um, you know, saw uh, that uh, Russia was surrounding Ukraine on on three sides and basically four sides with Crimea and the and the fleet there, um, and um, you'll recall that there was a lot of diplomacy going on uh, at that time, including in an unprecedented move, uh, the US administration in the UK uh, released classified information, not just you know, behind closed doors to the Ukrainians and others, but um, to the world to say, you know, Russia is going to invade Ukraine. And you know, this is how many men and uh, material are on the borders. This is what's gonna happen. And then as it got closer to February, they were very clear that this was not just going to be a little sortie into um, eastern, um, eastern Ukraine, that the ambition was much greater than that. It was for all of Ukraine. Um, and then later on, uh, you know, they released information about the assassination teams and things like this. 
I've never seen anything like that in my entire career. Um, and I think it was bold and I think it was really effective. And there's some evidence to show that it kind of actually affected the timing of the invasion itself because the Russians were not expecting that. Um, and I think that also, you know, behind the scenes, but also we could see some of it publicly as well, that um, the US and European powers were working together to put together a sanctions package if Russia invaded. Now you'll recall that Germany and France, first and foremost, but there were other countries as well, did not believe that Russia was going to invade, I mean, right up to the very end. And um, nevertheless, we were working with all these countries to put something together just in case. Um, and we were also working with other countries um, to think about you know, what kind of material support, security support would we provide to Ukraine just in case. Now, the US was quite sure that this was going to happen, other countries not so sure. Um, and I think that um, the, uh, the reason that um, the Biden administration was so strong on this, not to speak for other governments, um, not that I'm speaking for the, uh, the Biden government either as a retired person, um, but um, I think that um, you know, this is a man who has um, uh, you know, age does have benefits. You know, he has a lot of experience. He's been present at the creation for just about every major event in European security and in Europe over the last, you know, 40, 50 years. I mean, he knows this stuff inside out because he has experienced it. And so he recognized what this would mean, that this is a war, first and foremost, about Ukraine, but it is also a war about the um, international rules-based system and that Putin is trying to tear it down. And so this is a war about what kind of a world do we want to live in? And so Biden, I think, was very ready to take that on. Um, he, he took some hits in the United States, though, um, and, and maybe abroad, abroad as well, that um, because there were many in the US who were like, you're, you're saying this is coming. Why don't you, you know, do something, do something now? And um, I believe that the reason uh, the administration didn't is because you know, they were weighing, do we wanna keep the allies together and all of us move together? Maybe not as quickly, maybe not as, um, as effectively. Um, I, I don't wanna say as effectively, but maybe not as quickly. Um, or do we wanna you know, go, go, go out alone, maybe just with the UK uh, to do something that um, you know, preemptorily? Um, because there were a lot of countries that said that, you know, if, if you sanction Russia before it invades, I mean, that is provocative and it's, they're not going to invade anyway, so why are we doing this? Um, and I think you can see that continued sense that um, alliances and partnerships are super important in, you know, this most recent debate about the leopards and the Abram tanks and what is the U.S. going to do, what is Germany going to do, et cetera. President Biden was very clear in his statement yesterday, this is about all of us working together to support Ukraine. That unity is really important. And I think it is one of the, you know, the, the biggest strengths uh, for Ukraine, that it's not just you know, one United States or one UK that is supporting Ukraine, but it is a whole, you know, a whole group of countries that is strongly um, supporting Ukraine. So that was not short, sorry. Um, <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Um, the resolution of the conflict. So, um, I mean, I, 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 I just have to tell you that I don't agree with the premise of, of the question. Um, there, I, I don't believe that we need to find a way for President Putin to save his face. Um, there are many ways um, that he can stop this war, including by giving an order to his generals to pull the troops out of a country that is not their own country. He can stop this war today if he wants to. He has not chosen that path. And I think that, you know, as we look forward to the future, um, what is gonna determine, um, you know, the ultimate outcome of this war is gonna be facts on the ground. You know, who has the upper hand in terms of territory and various other things, um, which is why I think we are providing as much equipment as we can to Ukraine as quickly as possible so that Ukraine um, has the ability to, to fight and to win and to prevail in this fight. Um, so that when it comes to um, some sort of peace negotiations, um, which I presume is, is what is gonna happen, although you know, uh, one can never tell, um, that Ukraine has, has a strong hand um, to, to, to play in, um, in, 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 those, uh, in those negotiations. Um, so I think 
And the other thing I would say is that um, we can't allow what has happened before, you know, with Chechnya, with Georgia, with Ukraine in 2014, to happen now with this uh, 2022 war, to happen again. Because if Russia is not um, defeated, if Russia does not understand that, um, you know, this is not a good path for us going forward and being aggressive towards other countries, Russia will do it again. And all we need to do is look at what Putin has said um, over, over the years and those around him as well, including, you know, very recently. If, if Russia, um, you know, gets some sort of um, uh, advantage out of uh, the 2022 war, they will just regroup and rearm and they will set off again when they think that the West has been distracted by some other shiny object. And, um, and we can't allow that because, as I said, the stakes are Ukraine, which is, you know, important, but uh, the international global order is also important. We will not have peace in Europe if Russia keeps on going. We will have to stop Russia at some other point. And so it is best, in my opinion, to stop Russia in Ukraine. Um, 2009. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you know, the other thing I would say, so the question was, um, isn't it all our fault um, NATO uh, enlargement. about NATO enlargement and, and therefore we provoked Russia into um, invading a sovereign country? Um, no, I, I, I don't think that's, um, that's the case. I think that, um, you know, Russia um, made a decision to invade Ukraine. NATO is a defensive pact. Uh, it's been around for, you know, since uh, I think 1948. It is the most successful defensive pact in the history of the world. And it has kept more people more secure, more prosperous, and more free than any other defensive pact in the world. And I would add Russia to that list because peace in Europe benefits Russia and the Russians and the Russian economy as well. And so, you know, Russia has a choice. And in fact, you know, back in the day, um, there was the, the NATO-Russia um, um, institution, I can't remember the exact name, which was a very vibrant um, way for Russia and NATO to engage on important security issues in, in, in Europe. And, um, you know, Putin himself talks about talking to President Clinton, former President Clinton, about ultimately one day joining NATO, Russia joining NATO. I mean, hard to imagine even then, really hard to imagine now. Um, but um, I, I would say, you know, it was a different time then. And, um, and uh, you know, again, NATO was very open to discussions and working uh, with Russia. Uh, NATO still is. Uh, and, um, you know, again, the Russians have to take that outstretched hand, um, just as, um, uh, you know, uh, whether it's on, you know, the, the peace side or uh, whether it's on, um, you know, the NATO side. So, um, I, you know, the Russians have a choice. They can, they can choose to end this war. They can choose to have positive uh, relations with NATO or not. And they have chosen the latter. Let's open it back up. Um, I'll take this gentleman down here on the right, right across from you. Yeah, go first. Uh, and then you can hand it over to the woman right next to you. Hi, uh, Ambassador <clears throat> Yovanovitch. My name is Alex. I'm a master's student here at LSE in IR. Um, okay. First of all, as an American, thank you for your service um, over the last several decades. A couple of career related questions for mm -hmm. you. Um, mm -hmm. The first one being that as somebody interested in going into the foreign service. I'm curious, uh, especially as somebody who's served in several countries, to what extent you think language skills uh, enable or restrict opportunities uh, in the foreign service. Um, and then as a career diplomat who's served under multiple political administrations, um, how did you uh, push decisions that you didn't agree with? You, know, you were a representative and an extension of the government um, and, and surely there must have been mornings where you woke up and had to sell a line that you weren't fully convinced on. Um, and then finally, one on Ukraine. I'm wondering when you think uh, the moment that President Putin decided a, a full-scale invasion of Ukraine was 
the the optimal option for him, whether it's a long-standing dream um, going back to uh, the post-Soviet era or in the face of a, a weak international response to Crimea and Georgia and Donbas, or if it was a more recent opportunistic move. So I really like multi-part questions, but it takes up a lot of time. So going forward, one question. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Annabelle Ware. I'm a master's student in global politics. And that question relates directly to mine as well, which is, do you think there's any weight to the argument that Putin himself has changed over the years? Because early on when he ascended the presidency, there you could argue that he was rather enamored with Blair and Bush. And to, to your point that there was a time in which he was interested in joining NATO as well. So um, to the extent that his perspective of the world has changed over time, I'd be curious to get your thoughts. That's a model of brevity. Okay, we'll take uh, the question online. Yeah. Good to say we're welcoming more folks online from Germany, Denmark, Singapore, and Canada. And uh, this question comes from Mary Caldor. You, uh, you haven't mentioned Syria so far. How has the Russian role in Syria shaped or contributed to the horrors in Ukraine? Thank you. So Mary is an institution here at the institution at the LSC, the professor emeritus here. So three questions. Okay. Um, language skills, I think, are pretty important. Um, I mean, you can get by in English. English is the international language. Um, but first of all, at least in the U.S. Foreign Service, and I think this is true, much more true in other foreign services, you, you know, there are certain lang language requirements. Um, and uh, you'll be trained in languages if you don't come in with a language. Um, but in order to advance, you, you have to demonstrate some proficiency. Um, but I would also say, you know, beyond, you know, kind of tick in the box, you know, for promotion, um, you know, I, I do believe that listening is one of the most important skills of a diplomat, perhaps for everybody. Um, and, you know, if somebody is talking in their own language, they are much more fluent, you know, they can explain things in a way that perhaps they can't. I mean, I know when I speak a foreign language, you know, sometimes I have to like go around <laughs> and it's not as clear what I mean. I mean, I know that, but you know, I don't know all the words and the phrases and stuff like that. So language really important. Um, yeah, so decisions that you don't agree with. I mean, this is gonna be true whether you voted for that president or not. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, diplomacy or, you know, working in the government is not for everybody. Cause you know, this is true in every agency, right? Um, that the president's uh, policy is going to be, um, you know, one that you don't agree with. So I think there are a couple of things. Um, the first is, you know, when you're more senior and, and can actually influence policy, and maybe you're making policy uh, or at the table when policy is being made. The first thing I think is to make sure that if you have concerns about how this is going, that you articulate that and you make really clear that um, your, you know, the senior, the political people, that people at the White House, that they understand um, what you think the downsides are of going this particular way. And, um, you know, I mean, I think that, you know, it is the president's job or the person that he's delegated to to make that particular policy decision. It's probably not going to be your decision um, unless you are, you know, a remarkable high riser. <laughs> and, um, and so, Again, you know, not everybody would be comfortable by saying with, with what I'm about to tell you, which is you did the best you could. You were honest with your leadership. You spoke truth to power. You tried to tell them what, what it was. Now it is your job as a career diplomat to go out there and implement the policy and make it the best possible policy. Because there's a lot of creativity in, um, you know, in the field in terms of how you uh, express those messages and how you get people to do things that you want them to do in another country. Um, and to minimize downsides and you know, um, uh, accelerate the, the upside. Um, that's you know, not gonna be comfortable for everybody. Uh, you know, the other thing is I did not agree with um, the second Iraq war. I felt that that was a war of choice uh, that America made that was an unnecessary war. And so I um, didn't, you know, I, I, I chose assignments that were, uh, and I was able to do it. Uh, I chose assignments that, that did not uh, have me working on that issue. Now, if I had been, you know, told, you know, you need to go to Iraq tomorrow, what would I have done? Would I have quit? Would I have gone and said, you know, my country right or wrong, you know, my country needs me? I'm not exactly sure. But what I chose to do was to work on other issues. Um, so, you know, again, that's not, you know, not for everybody. Um, so you, you, 
you need to make these um, trade-offs. You need to make these decisions. It's it's a personal one. Um, and um, you know, in terms of when did Putin, um, uh, you know, kind of decide to to go forward? I mean, I. I and so I'll just take it with the next question as well, which is my own personal view. Well, first I would say is that I think Putin is a black box for many of us. And what happens in the Kremlin is a black box. Um, you know, like maybe maybe the CIA knows or <laughs> MI5 and 6, but, you know, I personally don't know. Um, but I, my own view is that Putin did not change. You know, he was a KGB officer, you know, from the time he was like nine and went and, you know, tried to get recruited by the KGB and they told him to go get a law degree. Um, um, and he, um, you know, is still a KGB officer. And I think there was a period in time when, um, you know, he was young and untested and untried and, you know, like, wow, you know, here I am in the Kremlin and I'm in charge. <laughs> um, and so he was trying to figure it out probably, but I think he reverted to type pretty quickly. And when you look at the people that he put around himself, that, that, you know, I mean, it, it's the old KGB guard basically. So I, you know, I, I, I just, I just think he's always um, been this way. I think he's amplified it over the years with um, the, um, you know, the, uh, the, I, I'm having trouble finding the word, but the sadness and, and the anger at the dissolution of the Soviet Union. I mean, he was in East, uh, he was in Dresden, I think, um, at the time. That was a frightening time when, you know, Moscow wasn't answering the call. You know, they didn't know what to do. And, um, and you know, all of a sudden he's in charge and he has a chance to make Russia great again, basically. And so I think, you know, he, he looked back to history. He saw himself as, you know, basically, I mean, he's told us basically a reincarnation of Peter the Great um, and is following that expansionist dream. But I think, you know, it was always there and he's dressing it up with um, kind of a perverted view of history. Um, yeah, so yeah, so I don't, I don't think Putin has changed. I think there was a moment in time when you know, maybe if things had been different, maybe he could have gone a different way, but I think probably not. Um, and then Syria. So I have to admit, I don't really know that much about um, Syria. Uh, when I was ambassador to Ukraine, um, what I would say is that um, the, the, the war in Ukraine and, um, you know, the ac um, action in Syria we could see, you know, first of all, the Wagner groups um, in both places. Uh, we could see that, um, you know, weapon systems um, being tried out in um, Ukraine and then transferred to Syria when it worked or didn't. Tactics, you know, tried out in Ukraine and then transferred to Syria. And, um, and um, you know, the leadership of, um, you know, Russian troops, Russian um, you know, uh, often they would get practice in Ukraine and then they would move on to Syria. So we could see some of that, um, but I can't really answer um, beyond that. Yeah. Let me take two more questions. Uh, question here. Here. What's that? Question. The question. The front row. Your student? <laughs> so, Ukrainian society. <laughs> the Ukrainian society. Oh, I think they should okay, we'll take, question. We'll take this gentleman down here and um, Okay, if you're gonna take your student, I got, one of the, <laughs> I got one of mine in the back there. So go ahead. Thank you for the preferential access. Uh, Ambassador Ivanovich, thank you very much for your speech. Uh, second year IR um, student from Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question uh, for, on, from the back, backdrop of your experience in Central Asia and post in Kyrgyzstan. Um, did you personally see any surprises in the reaction of the aging authoritarian bedfellows to the situation uh, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and more in terms of the future? Um, many analysts claim that China's role is growing in the region. How do you see um, Russia's and America's role respectively in the future? And we'll go back up here to, uh, he's got his hand up, Doug. Hi, Ambassador Ivanovich. Doug Klain from Atlanta Council and also a student here at LSE. Great to see oh, you. I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah, so I, I wanted to ask, um, for many of us, it's not a question of if Ukraine wins, it's a question of when Ukraine wins. And I would love to hear your thoughts on what you see the Ukraine of tomorrow after the war 
uh, what it looks like. And we've had talk of a Marshall Plan for Ukraine. What's its role in the world? What's its role in Europe? And what do things look like when things are better? Thanks. I think we'll, we're going to go with those two questions. Okay. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> you know, interestingly, one of the, um, I assume from Putin's point of view, one of the uh, unintended consequences of the war in Ukraine is that all of the other new and independent states, as we used to call them, <laughs> um, but um, the countries in Central Asia um, uh, among them, uh, you know, everybody's looking at this and what does this mean? And so I'll just um, use as an example, Kazakhstan, the, the largest uh, country, uh, very rich country with oil and gas, and uh, a very large uh, population of uh, ethnic Russians uh, and bordering Russia. And so um, I, I think it's, you know, I think um, previously we always um, kind of, or maybe I always saw Kazakhstan as sort of working very closely with Russia, kind of supporting Russia, et cetera, and not, certainly not getting in the crosshairs of Putin. Um, but actually, um, I mean, Kazakhstan is standing up and basically telling, uh, you know, including at the um, St. Petersburg Economic Conference in the spring, you know, in a, <laughs> in a, on a stage setting with Putin and um, the, um, I think it's the president uh, of, uh, of Kazakhstan, uh, Takayev, um, you know, I mean, he, he kind of said what's what. Uh, and I think that probably took a, a lot of courage. Um, so I, I, I think all of the countries are looking to see, number one, if, Ukraine, if, if Russia is successful in Ukraine, are they gonna be next? They're all afraid that they're gonna be next. Moldova, Kazakhstan, um, and then you know, not even to talk about the frontline NATO states that are bordering, uh, bordering, um, uh, bordering Ukraine and Russia and Belarus. Um, and so I think they're all wondering um, you know, what happens in that case, but they're also seeing um, greater flexibility for themselves in this time when Russia is so distracted with the war in Ukraine and pulling its troops from other places. So first and foremost, from Armenia uh, with uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and so forth, where, uh, you know, historically over the last uh, 40, 40 years or so, uh, Russia has been, you know, the stabilizer uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan. But even though there are, are Russian peacekeepers in Nagorno-Karabakh, they are not playing that role right now. And Azerbaijan, is increasingly emboldened and you know taking 50 yards here 50 yards there and the peacekeepers keep on being pushed back because ironically russia is not strong enough um is not i guess giving orders to its peacekeepers to actually maintain the peace maintain the agreed um lines um so i think um you know that whole part of the world um not to even start talking about internal russia because um you know russia itself is is already an empire I mean, there are many, um, you know, constituent parts, many, um, many republics within Russia of non non Russians. Um, and so what happens with all of those people as well? So it's, um, you know, I'm not giving you a very straightforward answer, because I don't think there is one. Um, I think, you know, this is history in the making. And all of you who are, you know, interested in inter international relations, maybe interested in a career in diplomacy, or in some other um, uh, uh, area that touches on international, um, you're gonna be seeing that and perhaps you're gonna be taking a role in, um, in how it all develops. And you know, the, uh, you know, I've, I've alluded to uh, the, the, the international uh, rules-based order, it's gonna change. Um, and you know, how do we reform it? How do we make it better? How do we make it more reflective of the world we are living in today as opposed to you know, the, war, the, the world as it was in 1945, um, and how do we make it more effective uh, in terms of some of the mechanisms that we need today and the challenges that we are facing today, like, you know, global warming and things like that, that we aren't really set up to uh, deal with very effectively. Mm -hmm. um, Marshall Plan. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, thanks, Doug. Yeah, um, so I am very optimistic about Ukraine. I mean, I think, um, you know, the Ukraine of the future is coming um, uh, at a great, great cost. Um, but what 
what that will mean is, you know, the, the fire that forges the Ukraine of the future is going to make that nation shine so brightly. I mean, this is a country, we've all seen the innovation on the military side, right? Where, um, you know, if you're a country like the US or the UK, you can go in with overwhelming uh, force and you don't need to innovate on the battlefield because you have so much more firepower. What we've seen in Ukraine since 2014 is they need to innovate. They need to, to figure out how weapons can work differently um, in different environments. They need to have different battle tactics. They need to you know, really work on the leadership piece and everything else. And they have done that. They have innovated. And we have been learning from them since 2014. And we've been learning from them incredibly so since 20, you know, the beginning of this war. And I think we're gonna see that on the economic front as well, because this is a cape, you know, all of the innovations on drones and, and weapon systems. I mean, this is a country of engineers, of well-educated people who know how to put stuff together. Um, and in fact, I think in 2021, um, uh, Ukraine had its first um, unicorn, which is um, a, a billion dollar IPO. You know, those are pretty rare and Ukraine had its first one. But there are all these IT companies in Ukraine um, and there's all sorts of other areas as well. And I think that, uh, you know, we used to think of Ukraine as kind of, you know, steel and, you know, kind of the metals and um, sort of a commodities, kind of a raw, raw commodities uh, kind of a country and agriculture. And I think agriculture is gonna be in its future, but I think it's also gonna be a service and, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, a, a service kind of economy uh, that meets the needs not only of Ukrainians, but the world. And, you know, this is a large country in the center of Europe. Um, if you uh, consider Russia to be part of Europe, then it's the second largest country in Europe. Otherwise, it's the first largest country in Europe. And it has a huge population, again, of educated people that want to live in Europe according to the rule of law. So we have time for one more question. I'm going to ask it. <laughs> so, um, so, um, so at the end of the book, yeah. you conclude, you reflect, or you summarize part of a, a speech that you gave at Georgetown. When you accepted the trainer award, you gave a, a speech so that's in 2020. And that speech covers a lot of ground, or your summary of it um, covers a lot of ground, but there were a number of different themes. But there was one that really like stuck out to me when I was reading it. And it was, you underscored at several points, the importance of trust in diplomacy. And so we have a lot of aspiring diplomats in the audience. Why is trust so important? Can you unpack that? Yeah. Well, I think um, trust is important, you know, internally within the organization that you need to trust your staff. Um, you need to give them the support uh, that they will do well. And then you need to trust them and not micromanage them and let them go forth and, and do their job and then provide them with the support afterwards. I think that's critically important mm -hmm. in terms of building a team, especially a team uh, like an embassy team, which is not only made up of people from the State Department, you know, sort of traditional diplomats, it's usually made up of, you know, tens of different kind of agencies doing different sorts of tasks, and you need to forge them into one team that works together. But trust uh, working with other countries, I think is um, critically important um, with, um, you know, certainly with allies and partners, that we are gonna have your back, that we are gonna be working with you, that if we say we're gonna do something, we do it, um, and it works the other way too. And, you know, I, I would, you know, sometimes have to call my, my international colleagues to account <laughs> on that, that they had made a promise and we were waiting for them to, um, to uh, actually implement that promise. Um, but I think that um, we need to be able to trust each other's word. And that goes with adversaries as well. And so, you know, I think back to um, the loose talk in Russia, which is still continuing, but not by President Putin, about using nuclear weapons. Uh -huh. um, and back in the fall, um, you know, President Biden said, we've told them, you know, that this is not a good idea and not to do it. And so I don't know whether it was our, you know, full and frank, in the words of diplomacy, full and frank discussion with the Russians, uh, or whether it was our um, no doubt request to other countries like China and India um, to uh, warn the Russians off. Um, but you know, by the time November rolled around at the Valdai conference, Putin was like, who, who, who me? No, no. 
no, that isn't it. Um, I mean, he has other people like former President Medvedev out there. I think he's now the deputy in the National Security Council, you know, with that message. But President Putin has backed off on that. And, you know, even as we have rolled through his supposed red lines, um, he has not used that tool. And while I think we always want to be, um, you know, very respectful, um, we can't make a mistake when it comes to nuclear issues. Um, I think it's a bluff. Um, and I think we've called that bluff. So I think it's important that um, adversaries understand that if we say something, mm -hmm. um, there are consequences. If we say that there is a red line and a country passes it, um, you know, I think we all remember Syria, um, that is not good for our credibility or for future diplomacy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the Biden administration is actually doing a pretty good job of laying down what our red lines are. So trust kind of works in different ways. Right. And, and I, I don't know, you know, I, I, I use the word trust, but maybe there's an even better word. Well, I think you're saying trust and credibility really matter, credible commitments. It's, it's fascinating. So, you know, I, I think, I mean, thank you for sharing your thoughts about the Foreign Service, Ukraine, you know who, Russia. <laughs> It's real, I found it very insightful and helpful. I'm sure everybody else did. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank all of you.